Hi everyone, I'm GK. Today's topic is what do the traditions of the bar stand for? For that we have to go into the oldest records of the Inns of Court and that is in the black books of the Lincoln's Inn and the glimmerings of the beginnings of the bar can be traced back to the year 1422 but there are some historians who trace the origins back as further than that. When the British Empire expanded, British barristers came into the Commonwealth to set up business, first to India and afterwards to the other parts of the Commonwealth and eventually they came to the Malayan bar and with them they brought the traditions. But in Malaya and afterwards we were called Malaysia, we have our own homegrown traditions as well. The first point that we need to ask ourselves is why are the judges known as the bench and why are the advocates called as the bar? If you go to a court, you will find three parts to it. There will be an elevated bench on which the judge sits and then there will be a gallery. In the old days, it used to be in the shape of a V. So the middle portion was known as the well of the court. The gallery would be here and the judges would sit there. And there was a bar that separated the gallery from the well of the court. And there was another bar that separated the barristers from the judges. And those who sat between these two horizontal wooden bars were known as barristers, hence the name bar. And the judges, because they sat on a long table which was very high, it was called the bench. Those who were advocates were empowered by tradition. And only they were empowered to sit between the two bars. And no one was allowed to cross into that space unless invited by the judge and over the years a lawyer will never say to you I'm a lawyer he would say I'm a member of the bar. That word bar will find its way if you notice into many statutes across the commonwealth for example the Malaysian Legal Profession Act has the word bar. Every profession has uniforms. A policeman has a uniform there is a reason behind his uniform a soldier has uniforms, every regiment has its colour and also the lawyers have their uniforms and no discussion of tradition of the bar will be complete without any explanation of the usage of wigs and bands and gowns and particular expressions and certain codes of conduct and we're going to go there. I now wish to speak to you about the robe and show how it looks like. Let's start with history. Barristers used the robe during the medieval times and the robe, which looks like this, and I'll describe it in a minute, was a sign of scholarship. During the Tudor period, robes were closed at the front, like this, and they were brightly coloured. The robe that is used in Malaysia is the same robe that's used all over the world. It's got certain common features and I wanted to show that to you. This is the back of the robe. Can you see that? It's got pleated shoulders and it's got a sleeve that's, that looks like a bell. So it's bell shaped. It's only worn by juniors. The seniors called Queen's Council if the Queen was reigning and if it was a King who was reigning, they were called King's Council. They wore silk gowns with elaborate button jackets. Malaysia has done away with the tradition and the difference. There's a reason for it. I'll explain to you in a minute. Why black? Why not brown? The British tradition of wearing black was adopted in the year 1694. There are two hypotheses for it. One states that when Queen Mary II passed away, the mourning dress was black in colour and that they used it as a symbol for mourning and it was adopted and continued. The second theory I think is more plausible. Historically, if you do some research, you will find that black dye was expensive. It wasn't available to the commoners. It was not affordable. It was only used by the aristocracy. The color black, black tunics about 400 years ago, only those with tertiary education used it and most of the time they were members of the aristocracy. They had the money, they had the privilege, they were well healed and therefore it was reasonable for them to have used black. Later on, by the 20th century, black gowns became a fashion. Now the gown itself has certain historical symbols that I would like you to see. 
let me take you to something that you will enjoy listening to and that is at the back of this jacket this robe you will see this triangular piece of pouch and you will notice that it is attached to a long pipe we'll deal with that in a minute now this is called a chute or a pouch it is always on the left side of the shoulder and it has got two little openings there's an opening here and there's an opening here and you put money inside it and in the old days they didn't have notes they had coins it was used as a money sack barristers usually were aristocrats they were too rich to put their hands out for money it was considered cheap so in order not to offend a barrister if he did a reasonably good job the client would come as emolument slip into the chute some coins it will find this coin will find its way to the front on the left hand side into this liri pipe as it is called if you look at the back the chute has got two parts this is the larger one where all the silver coins were supposed to go and this is a smaller one where all the gold coins were supposed to go into it and so in this way they paid the money from the back it was to preserve the dignity of the council and i suspect it was also to conceal exactly what was paid because he had no idea the only way he could find out would be to move this about and the heavier the jingle of coins then he would be persuaded perhaps that he was uh, well rewarded and the second hypothesis is after the death of charles the second it had formed a hood at the back of a rope which they would use it as a mourning hood and this was left behind as a vestige now the high court judges and the sessions court judges and the subordinate judges used scarlet and violet robes but the sessions court judges afterwards fell back on black robes and obviously their robes will not have this because they cannot be paid for their services at all they were appointees of the king i move on now to the wig unfortunately i cannot show you a real wig they're expensive exceedingly expensive and they're difficult to get now it is said that when charles the second returned to england from france he had gone to visit the court of louis the 14th he brought back the trend of wearing the periwig it's a long thing that's a wig and it became fashion in court and fashion conscious members of the english court adopted it and barristers obviously must have fallen into this fashion and the record seems to suggest the year 1663 on the story of robes and wigs i've got something really interesting to tell you a cabinet minister in malaysia was accused of murdering his political opponent and the trial ended up it was called the mokta hashim trial it was before mr justice hashim yob you know what he did he created a stir by removing his wig in public and casting it aside and with that hundreds upon hundreds of years of tradition i used to wonder why he had done that and then a series of historical events seems to justify it for example in july 2007 the judges of the new south wales courts in australia they voted to discontinue with the wig and senior members of the bar say that by the 1970s the wigs had disappeared and when we ask why did the wigs disappear they say two things one they were exceedingly difficult to buy or maintain and in a hot country like ours the wigs tend to itch and you sweat quite recently the speaker of the house of commons in britain removed the wig formally and some years ago the lord chancellor himself in britain dispensed with wearing the wig but you'd be surprised to know in hong kong judges and lawyers and barristers still continue to put on their wig which now brings me to the next item in the ensemble of advocates it's the bar jacket senior advocates adopted a waistcoat and they combined it with a jacket into a single garment it was known as the bar jacket or the court waistcoat um they donned it they didn't use a jacket over that 
Lady advocates, on the other hand, wore dark suits but no wing collar and they wore bands attached to a collar. Now let me deal with what's called the jabo or the band. Let me reach out for that for you. And here it is. This is a tab and it's also called the jabo, spelt J-A-B-O-T. And until 1640, it wasn't introduced. Then in 1640, it came into fashion. Before 1640, lawyers and counsel who appeared in court used necraf. If you go and look for a photograph or a picture of Vasco da Gama, you will find out that under his chin, he will have a necraf. Counsel changed neck ruffs for falling bands. You see the band falls like that. And they were concealed under the collar like that. And they were attached to a wing collar. Let me stretch my hand out and show you what a wing collar is. That's a wing collar. It's got a wing here. It's got a wing here. I'll deal with that in a minute. I'm going to put it here. I'm going to take you to what the Lord Chief Justice said, not last year, but a few hundred years ago, on the 2nd of May, 1594, at the Middle Temple Hall. And he said these words. These two tongues, he meant this and that, these two tongues do signify that as you should have one tongue for the rich for your fee as a reward for your long hours of study and labours, so also you should have another tongue ready without fees, without reward to defend the poor and the oppressed. The gown is important and it's black in colour and these symbols are worn uniformly by all counsel who appear in court. It creates equality. So a senior man or a senior lady advocate and a junior lady advocate, when they appear before a judge, there's no difference at all. The senior gets no privileges and the junior is subject to no prejudice. The court is only interested in the truth and in the quality of the arguments and the evidence before it. I now take you to other traditions of what we do in court. Have you seen uh, lawyers who come to court? They bow before the judge. Now they are not bowing to the human being who's dressed as a judge. They are in fact bowing to the king whom the judge represents. So there's the king, there's the judge, there's US counsel and you bow. But if you now go into one of these Malaysian courts or Singapore courts or Indian courts, at the back there will be a symbol of constitutional supremacy and we're all bowing to the constitution. So that is a tradition. The next tradition I would want to talk about is the traditions that we use in the course of arguments. You refer to your opponent as my learned friend because he's learned in the law. To refer to your opponent as my opponent or he or my friend is to wound him mortally. Never done. Ungentlemanly. Always my learned friend. When counsel is on his feet, his opponent cannot interrupt him. He's addressing the judges. He's putting his best points across. You can't be sniggering, laughing, saying that or cracking a joke with your juniors or shaking your head. I remember once when Raja Aziz was leading me as counsel about 30 years ago, I moved my shoulders because it was stiff from sitting still for many hours and Raja Aziz tapped me on the shoulder for a little while. He turned and said, do not distract the judges and please do not distract your opponents. It was like the earth had opened up and had fallen into it. So please remember, when you have counsel on his feet, do not interrupt him. If you have something to say, rise, ask permission from the court in a very humble tone and say, my lords, my lady, may I interpose? If you are given permission, speak. If you are not given permission, subside quietly without the rustle of clothes. So your tone is everything. You have to persuade the judge. If the opponent is rude, if he's yelling at you and is calling you names, do not respond. Do not create drama in court. Do not shout at him. Do not wag a finger at him. Fold your hands. Be grim and quiet and still 
when your turn comes rise and address the judge and put the points of your client's case across to him courteously clearly precisely so that your client can win you are not there to create a ruckus in court you are there to help your client your client is everything justice is everything the judge is everything don't go and get into a fisticuff with your opponent do not get into drama no hysteria judges don't like hysteria what they want to hear is the quiet clear unassuming voice of reason the next point that you have to consider is what's called the call to the bar at the end of a training the pupil petitions the high court to be accepted and enrolled as an advocate and solicitor or as a barrister and in malaysia what happens is we have a homegrown tradition a very senior lawyer called the mover rises and speaks to the judge on behalf of the pupil he's called the mover because he moves the court to accept her in malay they call it pinta we ask so what happens is the mover will speak about the pupil some movers quote poetry some movers quote scripture others speak of matters that are of importance to the general practice at the bar justice the upholding of the constitution the rule of law and so on after the mover has finished his speech judge would make an order admitting and enrolling the pupil into the bar right there is a very malaysian tradition in the ends of court what happens is your name is called out and you just go past and go through the ceremony whereas in malaysia for example per pupil we may take as long as 15 minutes and one call has no more than 14 or 15 pupils it's a very old tradition the bar has held on to it it's doing very well and i'm quite sure it'll continue to do very well there is also a tradition of calling a trainee with the word pupil i have heard people refer to pupils as chambies i'm a chambering at this firm i'm a chambi at that firm that's an insult it's an insult to the trainee it's an insult to the traditions of the bar respect the trainee and use the word pupil it's got hundreds of years of tradition behind it and now i come to the end why do we need traditions at the bar every profession has its tradition the bar has its own but why bother with stuffy old rules well traditions define who we are traditions identify our creed traditions identify what we stand for we fight for the rights of the poor and the oppressed and the wronged our traditions are hallowed by time by observing traditions we pay homage to those who have gone before us it is they our predecessors who have made our path easier to tread they have set an example for us george sia Raja Aziz the greatest judges and in so doing we leave behind a legacy for those who would come after us so that in that way we would ensure that they would walk the professional path that is why we need traditions thank you very much for listening i hope you found it interesting i hope you will like it subscribe comment and share with your friends have a good day